Hello and welcome to the third episode of The Ship Pod. This time around, I'm going to talk about the true story of the meeting of the Carmania and the Cap Trafalgar in World War I. As a main source for this, I'm going to use uh, Colin Simpson's The Ship That Hunted Itself. Very interesting book. I really suggest you read it. I'm going to leave out an awful lot of information that that book covers. And yeah, I'm going to try and make this a slightly shorter episode so it's less of a snooze than the Villa Milaus one. But yes... So the main moral of today's story is that war is bad. Um, and yeah, this story for many people, less so today, but back in back in the day, was a uh, pure example of just how terrible war is because that's a ship's horn. That's another ship's horn. I live, I, as I say, I live near the port of Rotterdam. So <laughs> yeah, and uh, there is a, uh, I live quite close to Valhalla where uh, lots of uh, support vessels leave from when they leave. They, the office for Schmidt is there, so they blow their horn to say goodbye to the office people. And that's what they're doing now. Okay, but yeah, no, the main moral of today's story is that, yeah, war is terrible, and it and it acts for many people a, as a story of, of just how pointless war is and how, yeah, it's just terrible. And you'll see why, because you have these two wonderful liners who have to knock 10 barrels of crap out of each other. But we'll get into that. So I will introduce our first character, the RMS Carmania. Yes, I know there's different ways of saying it. That's how I say it. Sorry. Uh, she was a Cunardo and she was built in 1905 at the John Brown shipyard in Scotland. She was a fairly standard transatlantic liner and she operated the route between Liverpool and New York. She was just shy of 20,000 gross tons, and she was 207 metres long and 22 metres wide. She had three propellers and a speed of 18 knots. Additionally, she also had the, the classic Cunard profile, so a large black hull, a white superstructure, and she had two Cunard funnels, so the, um, the, the red the dark red funnels up until a point and then they're black at the top with uh, some like darker small like rings going around to add a bit of definition but all things considered she was a relatively standard transatlantic liner she was a lot larger than what would be standard on other routes so for example to uh, potentially to south africa or to australia but yeah for the north atlantic she was pretty standard on the other hand, however, our second character, the Cap Trafalgar, was anything but standard for the route that she was on. So the time period we're talking about here, it's 1914, and the Cap Trafalgar, she was brand new. She was for the hamburg South America line, and she was a little bit smaller than the Carmania. She was uh, 18,000 gross tons. She was 187 metres long and 22 metres wide. Her hull was a very dark blue, but like from... <laughs> to anyone looking at it, I assume it would look black. So the descriptions say she had a, a white superstructure with three funnels. And the funnels were quite unique in that they were three-fourths white and then one-fourth red at the top. So they were very striking and quite unusual for that time period. And her deck resembled kind of like the Mauritania with lots of ventilation ducts. And additionally, she had uh, lots of glass in her superstructure and awning space. And funnily enough, her existence was to try and introduce or to try and capture the British market. So uh, Hamburg's Out America Line wanted to uh, stop off in the UK from Germany on their way to South America to pick up British passengers. And her name, Cap Trafalgar, although named after Cape Trafalgar, which isn't in the UK, um, if you are British or you know anything about British maritime history, the Battle of Trafalgar was a very important naval battle for the UK when Nelson, whose first name I forget, uh, was very... Uh, that's where he kind of came to uh, be well known. I think it's where he died as well. I'm sorry, I should have researched this beforehand, but I didn't. But if you are ever in Westminster in London uh, and you see Nelson's column, well, there you go. That's he. The Trafalgar is where he made a name for himself. Or was killed. Or both. I don't know. But yeah, I digress. On the 10th of April, 1914, Cap Trafalgar commenced her maiden voyage. So she left Hamburg, she stopped off in Southampton, and then went across the Atlantic and stopped off at a few ports in South America. And not much really happens with her for the next few weeks. The next notable thing happens to the Caramania, the day after the UK declares war on Germany. So this would have been the 5th of August, 1914. 
The Carmania at the time was a few days out of New York. She was on her way back to Liverpool. Throughout the day, she had seen or her crew had seen a British warship called HMS Bristol in the distance. And yeah, it was it was a normal voyage. And despite the fact that war had been declared, uh, from a, from my understanding, the crew was not aware at this stage. They were about to be, though. So later in the night on the 5th of August, the crew realised they can no longer see HMS Bristol. And that in itself isn't too noteworthy. Ships enter and vacate the transatlantic sailing routes all the time at different stages, and they do weird stuff, and especially a warship, which could be doing any amount of random stuff. So they didn't think much of it. That was until in the night they saw, uh, on the bridge, they saw HMS Bristol steaming directly at them. And the bridge of the Carmania went absolutely berserk. They were messaging like mad saying, you're steering into danger. And uh, yeah, apparently the, the captain was summoned. And yeah, it was absolute chaos. And just to put this into perspective, this was only a few months after the Empress of Ireland. Uh, a Canadian ocean liner had been sunk by a, a Norwegian, uh, I want to say tramp steamer, but it's probably like a, a small cargo ship. And yeah, they uh, no doubt were concerned that they could be replaying this in much deeper and much more isolated water. But it wasn't long until HMS Bristol had adjusted her course. Uh, HMS Bristol, of course, the crew on, on her knew exactly what they were doing. And uh, Carmania received a, uh, a message, a signal saying, Carmania, war declared, darkened ship, radio silence. And that was it. HMS Bristol disappeared back into the night. And I'm not quite sure uh, if that would have done anything to dampen the uh, chaos which was on the bridge or um, may give anyone reassurance. I'm sure it didn't. But yeah, that's how the crew of the Carmania knew that the UK was now at war with Germany. And this prompted the captain, Captain Barr, to then go to his cabin and open his safe and look at the uh, instructions that he would have to follow in the case of war. And we should also remember that Cunard got a very large loan from the British government, I think in around about 1905 to 1909, uh, for the construction of a few ships of which the Lusitania and Mauritania were two of them, uh, with the deal that if war broke out, the British government would be able to requisition Cunard's ships and use them in wartime service. And so when Captain Barr opened his safe and saw his letter from the British government, it stated that in the event of war, he would have to report to his destination and hand over his ship to the Admiralty for conversion into some sort of military use. Meanwhile, the Captrafalga had been sitting in Buenos Aires, Argentina for a little while. And after war had broken out, the crew was not sure what, what they were going to do. Initially, Captain Fritz of the Captrafalga wanted to head back to Germany with a full complement of passengers. That became unrealistic as time went on, and he then thought it would be a good idea to take the ship to the US, where the US was currently neutral. So he figured that the ship could go there and even go under the US registry. That also became less possible as time went on. And also, we should remember, war at sea at this time was not all-out warfare. So although it was possible for ships of an enemy to be sunk at will, it was less likely for a merchant ship. So for example, an ocean liner or a cargo ship to just be randomly sunk by an enemy. Or if they were, it was more than likely that a if it was a U-boat that they would surface and they would ask to board the, board the ship, inspect it for unit munitions or any sort of good which would help the, their enemy and then they would ask the crew of this ship to leave they'll go back to their u-boat and then they would well sink it or in some cases they would just allow the ship to go and uh, hope to find it when it was fully laden with cargo but yeah so it wasn't unreasonable for the captain to think that maybe going back to Germany was a good idea at this point, and this was before the Lusitania. So as the options for the crew on where the capture Falga could go diminished, also so did how they would ever get to any other destination, because at the time Argentina heavily relied on the UK for its coal supply, 
And the UK had convinced Argentina to, although Argentina at this time was also neutral, they had convinced Argentina to not allow German ships to bunker coal. And so the Cap Trafalgar and most of her crew were just sitting in Buenos Aires doing nothing, really just waiting for something to happen. Caramania, on the other hand, had by this stage undergone her conversion, and this was to be an armed merchant cruiser. For this conversion, she had eight guns installed uh, of 4.7 inch calibre, so they could fire almost eight kilometres into the distance. All of her fittings were taken out and she had two new communication systems installed. So one internal and one for uh, ship to ship and ship to shore communication. And there were other general utilitarian modifications made to her. And when she was ready, she went out on patrol around the waters of the UK. And before long, she was then ordered to go across the Atlantic to Bermuda. Another key detail is that Germany was really lacking in their ability to arm their merchant cruisers. And a quirk of how the German Imperial Navy was working at that time meant that the person in charge of arming the merchant cruisers were was sorry uh, very neglected in the power structure. And as such, it was a complete disorganized mess and is why the Cap Trafalgar stayed, well, another reason why the Cap Trafalgar stayed so long in Buenos Aires. However, soon the crew of the Cap Trafalgar was able to overcome this. Now, even back in the times of World War I, Argentina had a fairly large German population. Now, the population wouldn't really explode until 1945, but yeah, so the, the local Germans in Buenos Aires were able to bunker the, uh, the Cap Trafalgar quite discreetly, so much so that the Port Authority didn't, did not know that this had happened, and neither did the British who were basically spying on the ship at this point. So when the order came through from the German Imperial Navy that the Cap Trafalgar was to sail to Trinidad, a small island in the Caribbean, they were able to. They they went at the middle of the night, they slipped out in bad weather, and yeah, the next morning, the people who were in charge of making sure that Cap Trafalgar wasn't leaving arrived at the, the quay and uh, yeah, realised they had messed up. However, on board the now sailing into the Atlantic Cap Trafalgar, there were an assortment of quite random people. Uh, lots of the crew that she had gone over to South America with from Germany had left South America already. They, were, they wanted to go back and be part of the German war effort. And the crew that did stay, uh, well, it wasn't many of them. It was enough to maintain the ship, but not enough to uh, do it properly. So lots of ship staff who weren't mariners by trade, such as chefs and uh, like I think what you would call hotel staff today on cruise ships and um, entertainers were basically in charge of making sure that the ship was running properly so yeah I think even members of the band were having to shovel coal or something like that which was yeah geez and interestingly yeah as I said she was still carrying a very small number of passengers in a really random fashion that I don't properly understand. One of them was a doctor, a German doctor, who wanted to go back to Germany with his pigs. Uh, so he was a pig farmer doctor, apparently. And um, yeah, he has a little interesting story that we'll come back to in a minute. But basically, he was uh, a fairly old man at this point and was like, yes, I want to do my patriotic duty. And the captain of the Cap Trafalgar was like, uh, yeah, OK, uh, you can look after the birds in the winter garden, the little tropical birds that were in the cage. And yeah, that was his patriotic service. And his pigs were being kept towards the stern of the ship, so quite far aft, um, in some sort of gated area that existed. And yeah, there is a picture of them, I think. If I, if I found it, if you're on YouTube, you are probably looking at it right now. So there you go. A pig on an ocean liner. And it was these first few days out of Buenos Aires for the Cap Trafalgar where she really started to get interesting. So the Germans were fully aware that they were basically on a sitting duck in terms of what they looked like. So there were not very many three-funneled large steamers in the South Atlantic, or at least there shouldn't have been. So they came to the conclusion that they needed to try and disguise themselves. And the easiest way to do this would have been to become a two-funnel steamer, large steamer, of which there were slightly more of them. And most importantly, there were quite a few British steamers which were two-funneled and quite large. That could supposedly be in the South Atlantic. And 
The idea being that if the Cap Trafalgar could look like a British ship, then any British warship which came across them would be able, uh, sorry, it would be delayed in trying to figure out who they were or what they were doing and wouldn't think that they were an enemy straight away and basically would give the people on board the Cap Trafalgar the advantage. So while this discussion was happening on the Cap Trafalgar, they were asking around, you know, who knew or what, what she, who could she be, could be turned into, blah, blah, blah. And basically someone on board had recently crossed the Atlantic on the Chiromania from Europe to the US and could provide enough details to be able to convert the the Cap Trafalgar into a ship that kind of looked like the Chiromania at sea. This is all happening at sea. That's very important. So the captain was happy with that and he greenlit it. So they started to dismantle the third funnel, the dummy funnel at the back, which luckily, yeah, was a dummy funnel. The, lots of the glass in the superstructure was painted white, so it would look more like the, the superstructure on the Chiromania. There was a dummy bridge installed and other random small changes which were important that if you're looking for a, a, tele, sorry, a telescope, a, um, a binoculars, you'd be able to identify the ship as the Chiromania and not as a German ship. So, yeah, and of course, the funnels have to be painted the Cunard way and, yeah, really quite creative. But yeah, so in the background to this, there were a, a few German colliers, so like bunkering ships and a German warship who were sailing from Africa to meet the Cap Trafalgar at this island. And long story short, on this island, the basically the, the warship surrendered its guns to the Cap Trafalgar and they basically made the Cap Trafalgar as adequate as possible to be an armed merchant cruiser. Although uh, she was very underarmed and she had no more protection other than sandbags, really, against shelling or anything like that. But remember, this is a mass simplification of what actually happened, and I'm only talking about the uh, the key events here. So lots of things are happening, and we get to the 14th of September, 1914, and that is when everything comes together. The Cap Trafalgar has been designed in her um, new life as a merchant cruiser to basically go alongside an enemy ship, so a British ship, and basically detonate um, and just try and destroy the uh, the British ship when this when the British ship would try and uh, board her to inspect the Cap Trafalgar for any munitions. So in mid September 1914, when the Cap Trafalgar spotted a ship in the distance, they immediately tried to identify her. Initially, they came to the conclusion that she was her sister ship, the Cap Trafalgar sister ship. Um, however, they quickly realized, uh, maybe not. And then they realized, oh, 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 she's us. <laughs> there was also quite a bit of confusion on the Carmania, thanks to the Germans, uh, disguise, <laughs> I guess, uh, they were trying to, they were struggling to identify the, this, this ship on the horizon, which was the Cap Trafalgar. So as soon as they got close enough to see the funnels, they came to the conclusion, oh, she's a Cunarder, or at the very least, she could be a, a Union Castle line. We're probably fine, whatever. However, the two ships, although they had requested each other to identify themselves through signal, they had not done so. And so the Carmania, the crew of the Carmania, decided maybe it would be a good idea to shoot across the bow of this, uh, of this unknown ship to basically force them to respond. And it was at this point when some of the people on the deck of the uh, of the Carmania started to think, hang on a minute, that's us. That's <laughs> If I was not standing on the Carmania, I would think I was looking at the Carmania. However, not long after the Carmania had shot across the Cap Trafalgar's bow, did the Cap Trafalgar release her flag and then the penny dropped. Oh, she's German crap here we go and then basically the Cap Trafalgar steamed straight towards the Carmania and the Carmania did the same they got into their positions which were most favorable favorable for them because their deck guns like the ships weren't designed to shoot at each other so they uh, <laughs> they had to get in all these weird and wonderful positions in order to make their guns most effective and yeah this is when the carnage began so very quickly Shells were being fired into the superstructures of both ships, and the Cap Trafalgar was using specifically a machine gun to try and gun people down on the deck, as well as try and damage 
anything they could, basically. And all of this basically meant that it wasn't too long before there was an awful lot of fire. So the, the Carmania's bridge was on fire and the Cap Trafalgar's dummy bridge that was built to make it look like the Carmania was also on fire. Not to mention there were shells landing and exploding in all sorts of places, such as the Carmania's uh, gun stations and the Cap Trafalgar's dining room. And yeah, it was very clear that the Carmania had the advantage here. Uh, as the fire on the capture Trafalgar was raging, it was obscuring the view of the Carmania, so the, the, the gunsman on the capture Trafalgar couldn't really aim as well. Um, yeah. And a, uh, an interesting detail is uh, the pigs from before were still on board, and they were still at their little pen at the back. And as the ship, as uh, capture Trafalgar began to sink... The author of uh, the ship that hunted itself did mention that a charitable soul, his words, not mine, decided to uh, let the pigs out, let the piggies out so they could survive. Um, so when I first read this about a year ago, I was like, oh, that's nice. Like they're going to be like that cat, which survived, like, I think it was World War Two. Like she sunk, she, uh, she was on a German ship that sunk and then two British ships that sunk. And then she lived in a retirement home in the UK. But no, apparently sharks came along and not only ate the pigs, but also people. Um, I wasn't aware that sharks were that vicious in reality. I thought that Jaws had basically demonized sharks. And I thought that sharks in reality only uh, attacked people by mistake, like surfers, if they like assume that they're a seal or something. But yeah, this is the only source I've got for this. And yeah, apparently lots of Cap Trafalgar's crew met their end in the mouth of a shark, and including the piggies, which is quite sad. Well, it's, yeah, humans dying is sad as well, but pigs don't declare war on one another. or well, they might, I don't know. Um, uh, uh, okay, I'm digging myself a hole. Nonetheless, the Cap Trafalgar, she is sinking at this point. She is gone. And yeah, so the crew were ending up in the water in lifeboats, but not all of them. And the Carmania is on fire quite badly and the the fire suppression system can't be activated as the water pressure is too low because of all the holes in the pipes and the hoses. And yeah, so the Carmania is eventually brought under control. Uh, her navigation aids are retrieved from the bridge thanks to two... Uh, brave chaps that managed to brave the fire um yeah and i'm not quite sure what happened to the crew of the cap trafalgar i'm assuming that they were brought on board carmania after this or were taken to a close by island i'm not particularly uh sure because i have I've, the book doesn't explain what happens it just ends very suddenly and it, uh, the book ends by the basically the the author explaining how the captain of the track cap trafalgar was basically crying no doubt his entire ship and a lot of his crew have just gone um yeah but there's a lot of detail about what happened on board the cap trafalgar so i'm assuming that they weren't just left there for dead but yeah that's the that was the end of the cap trafalgar she was sent to the bottom where she remains to this day uh, i don't know much about her wreck i have looked I think it was discovered, but I can't find much information about it. In terms of the Carmania, she did get what she she <laughs> received quite heavy repairs, and she returned to commercial service service sorry in 1919. Although I don't believe she actually took on paying passages until 1923 because she had to have quite a massive refit. Uh, I do have a postcard of the Carmania that was sent from her in the 1920s uh, that I found in my hometown, which is very odd. But yeah, so that's a cool connection. I'll have that on screen if you're on you on YouTube now. And yeah, this it, it's a really horrible story. It's a really it, it's such a coincidence, and it's used a lot as you know one of the greatest coincidences in history. And it is to an extent because of course you know there there are quite a few ships out there, and to to pick you know your if, if you're the Cap Trafalgar to pick a, a ship such as Carmania to disguise yourself as. And then to actually meet that ship and have it sink you, yes, that's a really big coincidence. But yeah, coincidences happen. They're not as rare as people think. But yeah, although I don't believe this has happened again. But yeah, and also, uh, I don't know, it just, it's like in a film when a dog dies and people like make jokes like, oh, people always like get sad about the dog, but not when like people die. 
and yeah, like with the pigs, kind of the same. Like I, I not to, uh, I'm not a crazy like vegan or whatever, but I, I don't eat meat purely because I, I find it gross. And so now I feel like I can have the moral high ground and I can find pigs cute without feeling like a hypocrite. And I do feel kind of sad. I'm like, oh, poor pigs. But then at the same time, many people on board the Cap Trafalgar died and many people on the Crimea died, not to mention all the countless people that died throughout the war anyways. And yeah, it just, it, it really is. It's a really horrible piece of history. And yeah, but we can sit here today and marvel at the spectacular event of two ships of which they're both attempting to look like the same ship well yeah meeting in a very adverse environment and one of them sinking the other so yeah for this episode i had tried to make it very uh, compressed so i am missing a lot that's why it's a bit shorter hopefully this makes it a little bit more entertaining hopefully i don't know and less of a snooze if i've made any mistakes or if you feel like i need to add anything that is really burning in you uh please let me know and i will mention it at the beginning of the next time i do this which hopefully will be with someone else, by the way, either about the Britannic or Red Funnel Line, so the ferries that go between mainland UK and the Isle of Wight. Um, yeah, I'm also travelling uh, <laughs> for the first time since COVID hit uh, next week to visit my family, so I may not be very responsive, and I don't know if I'll be able to post anything. It depends if my microphone fits in my uh, Ryanair carry-on or not. So, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I've really appreciated all the support thus far. And, yeah, I'm Alex, and, yeah, thank you very much. Bye.